Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillah. Ve salatu ve selamu ala Resulillah ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve men ve la. Welcome everybody to the Savina Society. Nothing but facts live stream where we, it's a couple minutes late. Ramadan uh, scheduling is crazy. Last night I had a program that was, I guess, geared to the West Coast because it went until 2.30 a.m. here in the East Coast. Imagine that. Went until 2.30 a.m. And <clears throat> then you have suhoor after that and all that stuff. And so it was a bit wild uh, in terms of timing. So here we go. Let's uh, go to stories of the awliya. And episode 200. Wow, subhanAllah. Episode 200. So that's always a nice milestone. And the key is to show up. Uh, key about it, which doing anything is just... Half of it is just showing up and doing it. Um, not going to advance unless if you keep uh, quitting or you're spotty in your attendance. So key is to show up. And here we are showing up even if we're a few minutes off schedule. But that's okay. Because today we're on Abu Bakr al-Tumistani. He died 340 uh, after the Hijrah and 951. Miladiyan sahib Ibrahim al-Dabbaq wa ghayru. وَكَانَ أَوْحَدَ زَمَانِهِ عِلْمًا وَحَالًا مَاتَ بِنِي سَبُورُ وَقَالَ النِّعْمَةُ الْعُظْمَى هِيَ الْخُرُوجِ مِنَ النَّفْسِ The greatest blessing is to be out of the control of your nafs. The intellect is what's in control. That's, the, that's what we're all about here. Your aql is what is in control. Okay? Your nafs... Your emotions, your whims cannot be in control. Your intellect has to be in control. Now the aql here, the problem with the aql is this. It's, it's clouded up by sins. And that's something part of our psychology is that disobedience, sins, they cloud up the intellect. right? And, and a person can't think straight once they're mired in sins. Okay, so he says, Al Khuruj min nafs wa nafsu adamu hijab Allah. Your nafs is the biggest hijab. Between you and Allah. And nafs is not just sins. Nafs is also self-aggrandizement. Your imagination of yourself. Your being so grand. That's also... Um, uh, <clears throat> it's also what one of the meanings of the nafs. Okay. Next, he says... The path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clear. Okay, I love this. The path to Allah is clear. Kitab was Sunnah Qaimani Bain Adhurina. The book and the Sunnah are right here in front of us. So because we have an intellect, we can receive communication from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the key to receive that communication to understand what is it that Allah wants from us. What does He want from us? That communication is critical. Okay. Otherwise, we're just grasping at straws. And we're just, um, if you ever see spiritualists, like generally people who are interested in spirituality, it's like they, they, they're, they're doing stuff that is just their emotions, okay? It's just their emotions here and there, right? So uh, they're guessing. But he's telling us here, The book in the sun is here. How do I understand what Allah wants from me? Well, Allah uses language. And language is interpreted with intellect. Okay? <clears throat> and then he says, وَفَضْلُ الصَّحَابَةِ مَعْلُومُ لِسَبْقِهِمْ إِلَى الْهِجْرَةِ The first transmitters of this religion are the companions. And hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala validated them. Because who's going to validate them? Who can val- who, no one's equal to them. Allah ta'ala validated them as transmitters. فَمَنْ صَحِبَ مِنَّ الْكِتَابَ وَالسُنَّةِ if you stick to this book and sunnah and you go against your ego and don't try to please people, that means ikhlas. It's like the, he's basically summarized ikhlas in two things. Go against your ego and don't try to be a, a crowd pleaser. That's how simple our path is. Honestly, if you're on the right track, right aqidah, right fiqh, and right tasawuf, it's not that hard. And you stick with it with ikhlas. Stick with it with the utmost sincerity possible. You will attain 
a wonderful state in just a matter it's just a matter of time you will attain it it's just a matter of time and sometimes it's just you marinate slowly in it but this is experience with people is that it's just a matter of time you marinate very slowly in the this book and you practicing everything for years and years and years and you'll pick stuff up you'll learn Next is Mansur ibn Ammar. Abu Sari, Mansur ibn Ammar, min ahl maru, min qariyatin yuqalu laha, din dan qan. He's from an area called din dan qan in Persia. Okay. He's a Persian. And he lived in Basra. And he said, min jaza, man asaba, man jaza, min jaza, man asaba, dunya, man jaza. من مصائب الدنيا تحولت مصيبته في ديني. We actually mentioned this last week. Whoever has a bad reaction about worldly tribulations, eventually that tribulation will be in his deen. Reason being is that this person has this reaction towards the dunya. You have lack of faith and realize bad things happen. Yes, they happen. It's part of life that bad things are going to happen. Tribulations are going to happen. Hardships are going to happen. Okay. These things will happen, okay? Tribulations will happen. And if you have jaza from that, and I warn you, I warn you all, fr- from the type of speech that is co- a constant complaint and victim. I was, a friend sent me a message about from somebody. He said, man, look, look at, look at this, this message. It was all about how everyone in the family is traumatized. He was traumatized by this, he was traumatized by or this trauma, that, this, this, all the dhikr is bad things. And not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, As speak, the, with the blessings of Allah speak. You know, there is, uh, uh, I'm not familiar too much with the, all of the du'at, but there is a da'iyah and an alim. If you ask me, he's an alim, even if we may disagree on some things. And he is a hafiz of Quran, and he is a hafiz, I think, of the Ash, uh, qira, he's alim of the Qiraat al Ashr, and he's out there. You can watch his videos. His name is what is it? Abu Tawba. Okay, I'm not familiar so much with the Salafi duat, but him I know, and I have to say I love from what I've seen from him. Right? He said that he was traumatized in jail for four years, or or he was victimized. He was wrongly taken to jail for four years. And he was in solitary confinement, okay? Solitary for most of those four years. Now imagine you see nothing but cement walls for four years. You're not going to be, uh, you're not going to be traumatized, okay? See that? Uh, hey, Omar, go down. See that YS Young Smirks podcast? It's three parts. You have to watch this podcast. Harun one time sent it to me. It was, must have been like, no, Harun, uh, Sheikh Harun Saleh. Sheikh Harun Saleh sent it to me. During COVID, early part of COVID, is a three-part podcast, and he sent it to me. He's like, I can't believe I'm watching the whole thing. And I'm like, looking at the length. Each one is about an hour and a half, and it's three parts. And I'm like, there's no way I'm watching this, right? So I just clicked it just so I can say I clicked it, right? And say something about it. He was right. I ended up finishing the entire first one from like, it was like 11.30. I ended up sleeping at one that night. I couldn't stop watching it. Put the screenshot so everyone could watch this 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 one, this uh, podcast. Uh, yeah, screenshot that. Or copy the pic or whatever. So in this, Abu Tawba says he was like in solitary for four years. The bulk of four years. Wouldn't you go crazy? And he was totally oppressed. And not only was he oppressed, turned out that the so-called student of his in Miami is the one who uh, is the one who uh, snitched on him and basically lied, selling, saying he's doing, making all these bombs and all that stuff. And it was his student that got compromised. His own student was compromised by the FBI somehow, like they they got some dirt on him, right? 
And no, don't put that one up. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> he, uh, I was just a, almost trying to, just to give you guys the backstory of why we're laughing here, almost trying to pull up this, uh, this pick of this podcast. He ends up put it, pull, pulling up the pick of the Safina Society uh, debit card. Right, so I'm like, yeah, don't put that up. I'll lock. <laughs> put the debit card up there, and we're going to be like broke at the end of the episode. But now, inshallah, we'll never be broke. Allah uh, always uh, give us uh, enough and more than enough to, to advance his dawah. So he ends up snitching on him because he got compromised. And then he ends up being in jail for that reason. So imagine that. Imagine that hardship, okay? There it is. The Young Smirks podcast. And then Abu Toba says, this is the part that's important. Abu Toba says that he needed therapy. Okay. He needed, he needed therapy after this. And I'm thinking to myself, where are you going here? Because you're not the therapy type of guy, right? So he goes, I looked around and I discovered and I found a... Quran school that teaches all 10 qiraat that has like a do- an apartment or a dorm or something that I could live in and study at. And it was somewhere far off in Canada somewhere. Or maybe it was Toronto, I don't know. Okay, But it was in Canada. He said, that was my therapy. So my therapy was eight hours a day I was learning the new qiraat. He already was a hafiz in Warsh and Hafs, but he was learning the other eight now. And then he said, my therapy was Surat Al-Duha. وَالْضُحَ وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَعَ مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَ وَلَا الْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنُونَ وَلَسَوْفِ يَعْطِيكَ رَبُّكَ فِي الْتَرْضَى أَلَمْ يَجِدْكَ يَتِيمَ فَأَوَى وَجَدَكَ ضَعْنَ فَهَدَى وَجَدَكَ عَائِنَ فَأَغْنَى فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرْ وَأَمَّا Yet the last ayah was my therapy. That's your therapy. That is a cure. It's medicine. As for the good things that Allah has given you, talk about it. So every time someone would see him, say, oh, what happened to you in jail? He would change the subject to something good that happened to him. And by the repetition of saying good things, well, what do you think starts happening to your mood? Try it. This is Quranic medicine, and it's free. It just takes a deep faith effort. It takes effort and it takes faith to just say something good. Stop saying what's bad, okay? Stop saying, oh, I'm weak at this. I'm the, you know what, the, what? If I have somebody in my family, if one of my kids says something negative about themselves or their work or their effort, or they're getting pinched right away. You're getting pinched because I want them to have an opposite association. I want them to associate saying the negative with feeling a pinch. Oh, I'm pinching you, okay? And then all of a sudden, they oh, okay, 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 everything's good. So it's not you're lying, but say what is actually good. Like, for example, you did, uh, you messed up a homework assignment, all right? All right, well, the positive of this is that now I know that I messed up on the homework better than messing up on the quiz, right there is always a positive on this okay so this this three-part episode i'm telling you not all it's it is not a waste of time type of podcast no you will be blown away by the imaniyats that come out of this man and i don't know the other things he says about like his aqidah teachings to be honest with you i don't know but from what i saw he's a balanced Maybe he's, he's, I guess he's a Hanbali, right? Maybe he's Maliki and Fiqh, but in Aqidah, he's more like with Ibn Taymiyyah and the Hanabila. Okay? But I highly recommend you watch that because the attitude, the attitude of positivity that he, by which he healed himself from this. Honestly, it's, it was to me, exemplary. So that's why he says, Man jaza min masaib dunya We don't have jaza. You have a calamity of the dunya, we don't have jaza. Jaza is like you're, you're wallowing in victimization and, and negativity. No. A'udhu billah. Okay. 
on him. Lodi says, is that John Fontaine? I really don't know who the host is, but he is Scottish. I can tell you that much. I think he said he was from Scotland. What happened? Why? Oh, okay. قال أحسن لباس العبد أحسن لباس العبد مضاف مضاف إليه التواضع التواضع أحسن لباس العبد التواضع والانكسار The best garment of the abd is humility and brokenness وأحسن لباس العارفين التقوى The best garment of the عارفين the people who know Allah is taqwa ولباس التقوى ذلك خير okay um saying who is he talking about we were talking here about Abu Toba and this one it's it's the best podcast I ever heard I have to say that three parts I watched all three the is really one of those things that people don't know what you're doing in the house is during covid they don't know what you're watching and then you're 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 so amazed by it you're like literally force everyone to sit and watch it and they're like we don't, we don't want to watch this right what are we doing here right you can't force people but i tried to um, you know show my kids some of it it was an amazing it was definitely without doubt the, the best podcast i ever heard in of all podcasts awesome. i was gripped plus i love his style did you did you ever watch him oh I've my god i've seen a lot of his videos though yeah yeah but i haven't seen that specifically yeah covid was a strange time it was like you discovered hobbies you didn't know you yeah yeah people make like i was making like what's it called everyone was making that coffee yep was it whipped coffee everyone was making was baking yeah everyone had like a new hobby that yep. they never knew they, they liked we came out of covid in our community with like five bakers like yeah. kids came in at 11 years old they came out bakers like every day baking something new what else are they gonna do وقيل سبب توبتي أنه وجد في الطريق رقعة مكتوبا عليها. Okay, it is said that the reason for his toba was that he found a small piece of paper in the road. Upon it was بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So he lifted it off the floor, off the ground, off the road. فلم يجد لها موضعا. So he didn't find any place to put it. Okay, so he just took it home with him. Okay. And he said he took it home with him and he put it on his a shelf, a high shelf. Then he saw in his sleep, Fatah Allahu alayka bab al hikmah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open the door of wisdom for you. Just for respecting this piece of paper. Okay. If you want futuhat, if you want spiritual openings, sometimes the answer is khidmah. Go to your local mosque and be of menial service. Be of service to the people who are doing stuff. Be of service, clean up, mop up. That's the type of people we want. We don't want this type of dilettante. You know these dilettantes with the $150 beads and he never, ever will pick up a cup, will pick up a plate, will fold a chair, will get up for the elderly. These are dilettantes. Sufi dilettantes. Hundred dollar beads with a book of muntik in one hand, right? And he's useless to the community. No, you're useless. You need to actually always be in khidmah. That's how Allah's gonna elevate you. If you see when you see youth, they people are always needing help. Okay, they always need help. They need support. Okay. قال أبو الحسن الشعراني رأيت منصور Mansur ibn Ammar fil manam. I saw him, Mansur ibn Ammar, in his sleep, in, in a dream. فقلت له ما فعل الله تعالى بك. What has Allah done with you? فقال قال لي أأنت Mansur ibn Ammar? He says to me, Are you Mansur ibn Ammar? Of course. And Allah knows, but it's asking just to break the ice. فقلت بلى يا ربي. Of course, my yes, my Lord. قال أأنت الذي كنت تزهد تزهد الناس في الدنيا وترغب فيها. Are you the one who used to tell the people, oh, get away from the dunya, stay away from the dunya, but you wanted it? Okay. He 
He said, it was like that. I used to tell people, beware of the dunya, but I wanted some myself. But there was never a gathering except I began by praising you. I always praised your prophet. And I gave sincere advice to the Muslims. And Allah says, Sadaqa. He said the truth. Give him a throne upon which he could sit and he could speak to the angels about me. The way that he used to sit and speak in the earth to my servants. Okay, So uh, that's why knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never ends. Whereas all knowledge, like I said, I can't remember where I was. Where did we, where'd we talk about brain surgery? Here? Yesterday? Yeah. Wouldn't the most important person be someone who is a heart surgeon or a brain surgeon in the society? Right? Removing cancers, curing, you know, people. But that knowledge comes to an end when you die. But the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never ends. So even the most valuable knowledge that we would all agree upon, at that moment, there's no one more important than the surgeon, right? Than that heart surgeon, that knowledge, that brain surgeon who's taken tumors out of brains, okay? Yet, when that person dies, that knowledge, the reward is with him forever, but the knowledge is not because there's, the, the knowledge has no benefit after death. It's limited. So it's very important here, but it's limited. Knowledge of deen and knowledge of Allah Ta'ala lasts forever. And here's another example where you're giving, um, uh, they're giving lectures in the heavens. Now, when it comes to these pieces of paper, Lily gives a good point. She says, what about these uh, Islamic events or charity or fundraising? And they pass them out. And they start with Bismillah Rahman Rahim, and they have Allah's name everywhere. This is a problem for us. So, uh, if you're involved in these types of things, don't put the name of Allah on these things. Just put the name of the organization and what you want from people. So, these things end up on the floor. That's why they end up in the garbage. Al Fudail ibn Iyad, big one, he is one of the big zuhad of our Ummah. Okay, and he's from Maru. Persia. Look at all these Persians. That's why when we lost Persia as Ahl Sunnah, the Ummah stopped advancing. If you think about it, we always had the Persians and you had the Turks. You could not stop this Ummah, right? But once that broke, okay, that was a big problem. Okay. And Fudayl ibn Ayyad, what happened with him? And what is his story? Abu Ali was his kunya. It is said that he was born in Samarqand. And he died in Mecca in the month of Muharram. And Fudayl ibn Musa, another Fudayl says, Fudayl he was actually a very clever uh, thief. And he, was a, he would cut the road, basically. He was a raider. He would see a caravan coming. He would assess how big it is, if they're armed or not. And his, him and his gang would cut them off and either take some of their money or all of their money or whatever they would take. Okay. Now, why did he make Toba? There was a young lady in the town. And he fell in love with this young lady. Okay, And in the old days, when you fell in love with somebody, that love was a little bit crazy because you really only saw her a little bit and then your imagination filled in the blanks. You saw her like once or twice and your imagination will fill in the blanks. Whereas today, you could see someone and people post pictures of them. You look at them forever. You, there's no mystery. But in the old days, you would see someone, let's say, in the marketplace and see them again. And then your imagination fills in the blanks. And then you never know where you're going to see them again, when you're going to see them again. So your imagination really takes over. And you're falling in love. Probably you're falling in love with an imagination. That's probably not what the person even looks like, but you're imagining that that's what they look like. And you're imagining that's their personality. So that's the problem. But that's why Aishq was so crazy back then. Because you only got glimpses of people. Okay? So he fell in love with her. So what did he do? This man is a gangster. He's a thief. 
So he climbed the wall so he could look at her. Okay? He climbed up the wall, the roof, so he could look inside her room. Semi and he heard a man reciting Quran. And he heard, Alam amanu and Isn't time for the believers, for their hearts to be humbled for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So he said, This sounds like this ayah just was meant for me. Okay? It was meant for me. Okay. Uga Panda, what are you saying? <laughs> oh, why'd you delete that? That was a <laughs> okay. Uh Pando saying he was also in love too. Well, it's okay. You can be in love. Iftar. Then he says that it hit me, the ayah. So I returned that night humbled and I said and I kept saying, Qad'an, Ya Rabbi Qad'an. Yes, it is time. It is time for me to to, to stop all this. Okay. So he's walking in this pen, pensive and penitent state. فَآوَاهُ إِلَّيْلُ إِلَى خَرِبَ And he uh, he ended up in a khariba, which is in, like a destroyed house, like an old house that's about to crumble. So he slept in it. Okay? And it's a, it's a village, an ancient village. Okay? And there he saw some people who had stopped uh, on their journey. And he hears them saying, hey, people, when should we leave? They said, let's leave now. And they said, no, no, leave in the morning. Why? Because Fuldaid is out. He said, no, 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 I heard Fuldaid is coming in the morning. So they're all afraid of him. And he's sleeping right there. So he felt so bad. Okay? He felt so bad that this was him. And Allah made him hear that. And very quickly, just like that, okay, he changed his ways. So... Al-jaza'u min jins al-amal, right? Your reward and your punishment is, it's parallel to the action itself. So what did he do? Fudayl ibn Ayyad, what did he end up doing? He said, I'm going to devote myself to protecting travelers. Okay? So he went to Mecca, and then he started the routes outside of Mecca. And he would go out, and he would help the people who were on the way to Mecca. That's eventually what he started to do in his life. After, of course, he studied a little bit. He learned. He sat with the shiuch. He made tawbah. But eventually, he was, he, he was like an outdoorsman. He liked to be outdoors all the time. So what he, the way that he would rectify all his sins was that he would go out the, in the paths of Hajj and, 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 and the paths of Mecca, and he would help the people. Go out with food and water, give it to them, and help the people. And that's how he ended up uh, rectifying all his sins and his misdeeds, so he made toba, and he went and he he went to Mecca. And he says, "Ida ahab Allahu abdan akthar ghamma." If Allah Taala loves a abd, He gives him a pensive state, like thoughtfulness. He makes him thoughtful. He he creates a situation, where, and you can't be thoughtful if you're always surrounded by people. So you thought He makes him love to be thoughtful. Okay. And if Allah does not like Abd, He always makes him busy with the dunya and with He never thinks of death. He never has time to think of 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 uh, preparing for death and akhirah. قال ابن المبارك إذا مات الفضيل ارتفع الحزن. So Fudail, his his main feature was pensiveness. Okay. His main feature was pensiveness. Right, Sophia, thank you for understanding. These are Ramadan days. My nights, I'm already on last 10 schedule, by the way, because of that California thing and the other things, and Friday and Saturday, I'm already flipped. My nights and days are already flipped. So thank you for understanding. He says, if the whole world was put in front of me, the dunya, and it was made halal for me, I would find it disgusting, just as you find the dead body of an animal to be disgusting. Okay? You find it disgusting. 
Well, it's all distraction and it's busyness. And the dunya is only good if it's blessed. The dunya is good if it's blessed. That means you're going to use it for that which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you're not going to let it control you. That's the key. Okay? That's the key. You're not going to let this, this world and this dunya control you. If it controls you, you got a problem. So how do you control it? By slaughtering it. How do you slaughter the dunya? By giving sadaqah. Give, it, give, it, give, give a lot of sadaqah. Now you, you're in control. وَقَالَ لَوْ حَلَفْتُ أَنِّي مُرَائِنْ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ أَنْ أَحْلِفَ أَنِّي لَسْتُ بِمُرَائِنْ To swear that I have riya is more beloved to me than to swear that I don't have riya. Because how can you swear that you have no riya? Okay? Then it turns out your claim is false. Never make spiritual claims is very dangerous. Making spiritual claims is extremely dangerous. ترك العمل لأجل الناس هو الرياء. Leaving off good deeds out of fear of people saying, "Oh, he's doing good deeds." That's رياء, he says. هذا هو الرياء. والعمل لأجل الناس هو الشرك. An action to get the reward from people. That's shirk, meaning ibada, doing worship, so that you can get the reward from people. He says that's shirk. وقال أبو علي الرازي, and it's shirk أصغر, not shirk أكبر that puts you out of Islam. وقال أبو علي الرازي صحبت الفضيلة ثلاثين سنة I was the companion of Suhaz of Fudayl for 30 years ما رأيت ضاحكا ولا مبتسما إلا يوم مات ابنه علي قلت له في ذلك فقال إن الله أحب أمرا فأحببت ذلك He said I'd never seen him laughing or smiling except the day his son died and he smiled on that day he said, why do you smile on that day? Your son died. He said, Allah chose for my son to be with him. So I smiled for what Allah chose. I, I loved what Allah chose. It's what Allah chose. SubhanAllah. Most deaths, most people when they die, if they've lived their whole life, you don't really feel sad for them. They lived their whole life. It's a minor sadness, right? What else could you want? And now they're in a phase where the life is not comfortable anymore in the first place. But some deaths, they're sad, and some deaths, not are, they're not just sad, they're, they're scary almost. So the death that's sad is the death of a child. But the death that's scary is the death of a dad. And sometimes a mom, where the kids could lose structure of their life. And I, Allah Adam, but my opinion is that to have a dad is more important than to have a mom. But to lose your mom is more painful. The mother touches your heart more than your dad, for sure. But the dad is one who gives structure to life. Okay. He gives you structure. He gives you order. He sets things right. That's how it's supposed to be. And he's capable of raising. Right? You can get an aunt to try to fill in the blanks for a daughter. But I don't think that you can get any man to fill in the blanks of a dad. Okay. Because the blanks that are going to be filled in by an ant are nice things. Oh, dress like this, be polite like that, don't say this in public. These are like nice little adab that I see women teaching other girls, teaching girls. But the the what a dad is going to have to do is usually negative. It's 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 harsh sometimes. It's oftentimes something where it's like uh, it's deep. And people who lost a dad, another man will hesitate to do that. They'll feel bad for him. Like, oh man, the, the kid's already like lost his dad. And let's be nice to him and all that. And that is probably not good for him. So that's why it's probably easier. You can't replace a mom, of course. But the lessons that one mom will teach may. And what, what is left? A big gap of that rahmah. So that is the pain. So there, you're, you're never going to be even. You're going to have a lot of pain that you don't have your mom there. But at least in the functionality of life, I think that um, it's easier to lose your mom than to lose your dad. The dysfunctional person is the one who loses his dad, in my opinion, and Allah knows best. I, I really don't know. Uh, but that's my opinion. I've seen people be very close to their dads, and they have structure. Yes, they may have like a little bit of a hole in their heart, but their lives are structured. 
their lives are moving properly. They're socially functional. And then I've seen people who they, they're very raised by a, a, their mom with no dad. These guys are like, you don't want to be around them. When they get emotional, oh my gosh, they don't stop, right? So it's harder to lose your mom, but it's more, it's a greater effect if you lose your dad. Allah Adam, I don't know. That's just my thoughts, and it's not like sacred law or anything, but it's just my thoughts. John Sasham Johnstone, will you visit South Africa one day? I want to visit South Africa. And I want to go to Australia again, too. South Africa's got a lot of shiuch, I heard, though. Oh, they got a lot. Everything's going on. They got the Malaysians and Indonesians. In one city, I heard from Sister Yusra Qandid that it's the Indonesians have taken over. The other, it's the subcontinent. Now they're like South African, but they're originally from the subcontinent. Okay. Abdul Qadir, I see your question. I'll answer it in a second. Ibrahim al al Qurmasini. Abu Ishaq is his kunya, and he says, Man arada an yata'attala, aw yata'battala, fal yalzam al ruqas. If you want your path to Allah to slow down and to stall, then find ruqas. Find ruqas. Ruqsa. Oh, the Hanafis allowed it. Let's do that. Oh, there's a, I heard a fatwa for this or that. What is the difference between a fatwa and a ruling? The ruling is Allah's law. The fatwa is saying that the situation has changed such that you don't have to follow this ruling and you can do this instead. That's a fatwa. That's a big difference between a fatwa and a ruling. You follow the rulings. A mufti gives a fatwa. That's up to you if you believe it or not. You have to understand that. And when you take a fatwa from somebody, the ruling is the general law. Fatwa is for a specific case. And you have to be very mindful who you take fatwa from. And the odds of everything is a fatwa, 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 fatwa. I asked the guy how he bought his house. He said, with a fatwa. I said, what? I asked him, like, did you use guidance? Did you use universal financial or whatever it's called? And he said, with a fatwa. A fatwa is how, that's how you bought a rule, your, your house? So, uh, fatwa. Kul haqab al fatwa. Fatwa, fatwa, fatwa. Right? That's not right. Rukhsa. This is a rukhs. You just, so you'll never have discipline. Okay? Discipline is the key. وقال علم الفناء والبقاء يدور على إخلاص الوحدانية وصحة العبودية ما كان غير هذا فهو المغاليط والزندقة ما كان غير هذا فهو مغاليط وزندقة السفلة من يعصون الله عز وجل ولم يتوبوا So he says here that all this talk about spiritual ranks and spiritual levels and spiritual stations, all of it surrounds a valid ibadah with pure ikhlas. That's it. All the spiritual stations, they end up being produced only by very simple things. They're the result of very simple things. Valid ibadah, sihat al-ibadah. You worship Allah how you want to, you have to worship Allah how the Prophet told us to. Okay, How Allah commanded us to. But you have pure ikhlas. That means you, you want the reward from none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. All right, let's stop here. I'll re- read one more because the page is, uh, we'll finish the page off. Mudaffar uh, al Qurmasini. He was from the Shiuch of the mountains. He used to live in the mountains. Okay. Well, this is good to end on advice on fasting. The fasting of the soul. What is the fasting of your soul? الأمل, which means shorten your hopes, meaning imagine yourself you're going to die tonight. That is how your soul fasts. You're going to die tomorrow. That's it. خلاص, life is over. Okay. How do you... How do you fast with your intellect? Is when you want something, yet the sunnah is telling you something else, you follow the sunnah, not your desires, not your whims. The fasting of the ego is from food 
and sins. وقال الجوع إذا ساعته ساعدت القناعة فهو مزرعة الفكر. Hunger okay, is the farmland of thought. In other words, deep thought. Having an empty stomach, it makes you think of deep matters, whereas having a full stomach will make you think of worldly matters. Okay. وينبوع الحكمة It is a spring of wisdom. وحياة الفطنة It is life of intelligence ومسباح القلب And it is the lamp of the heart. All of that is hunger. أفضل أعمال العباد The best deeds of people حفظ أوقاتهم الحاضرة Take advantage of your time. You should always be benefiting. Okay. وهو أن لا يقصروا في أمر Do not um, cut corners in anything. And don't pass your limit. Don't cut corners and don't pass the limit. So, we'll stop here in terms of stories of the Awliya. And we didn't do any QA, I don't think, yesterday. Did we? Huh? We didn't do any QA. Right, so, let's do some QA here. The hunter says If the mosques around me start the khutbah way before we enter Dhuhr time, is the Jum'ah valid? Not in any of the madhabs except the Hanbali madhab. The Hanbalis allow this. They're the only people that allow that. Okay. Society is suffering from all the nations fighting and dysfunctional people. People are becoming fatherless. There's no doubt about it that Iblis's path is to, to destroy the human being by destroying his infrastructure. Infrastructure of the human being is to have a mom and a dad, right? That's, you want to destroy that, you destroy their, so you either have people with no mercy because they don't have a mom, but more likely mothers will claim their babies and dads will leave. Or dads are not worthy of being, of, of being followed either. That's another problem. The dads may not be worthy of being followed, right? And that, you see that often too. A guy is not worthy of being followed. And he has no knowledge of, of what, what's right and wrong because he has no deen. So he just go, accepts whatever happens. That's what we're seeing a lot of that too. Women can play a part of a mother and father. Men cannot do this, says Tahir Omar. I'm talking from experience. Okay. They can, but do the, do, when, if a woman has to discipline a young man, is it taken as well by the young man and does not the woman have to completely transform? The woman will have to transform into something that she's generally not. Okay. So, do they have to do it? Yes. Do they sometimes achieve it? Yes. But does it have consequences? I think so. Yafa says, any du'as to help my friend? She's going through a lot with her family so much so that her mom took her the other day to a sheikh and said she has a jinn. Oh, Allahu Adam about that world. I do not know about that jinn world. I don't know. I can't tell you, to be quite honest with you. But, Surah Al-Baqarah, recite it every day, cover to cover, or beginning to end. Okay. Trying to strip the dunya from your vision to see reality says Melody 21. The best thing is to use the dunya for the sake of uh, others. Then Allah will give you more dunya and that is the right way to use it. You know, to use a little bit for yourself and use it for others. Any updates on the UK visit? No, since Ramadan started, there's been no activity pretty much. No updates on the UK visit. No updates on... We've done nothing pretty much on any front. Basically, we just done the stream and that's it. So we will, we'll, we'll get there. I have a question, says Uga Panda, who we met in New York City, by the way, at NYU. Is it better to spend money on gifts to make family ties stronger or to give sadaqah? To spend money on gifts and make the family's ties stronger is better. Because that is a type of sadaqah. You can intend it to be sadaqah too. 
what is, can you briefly explain the 10 qiraat? Sure. Very simply. Prophet Sallallahu re- received the Quran in the Arabic dialect of Quraysh. All the Arabic tribes had different dialects. They all were different. Okay. When the Prophet would go and recite the Quran to one of the Arab tribes, but he recited it in the Qurayshi dialect, he saw that the reaction was a little bit off because it's a different dialect. So he asked Allah Ta'ala to re- re- reveal to him the Quran in the dialects. And so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala gave him a second, then a third, then all of the Arabic dialects. So the Quran was revealed initially to the Prophet in all the dialects of the Arabs. So when he would go to an Arab tribe, he would recite the Quran in their dialect. Then that the function of that was to win over the Arabs. But once the Arabs had entered Islam, and they could now submit to one dialect, in the time of Uthman, okay, is that is, is they, they found that having all these dialects just caused confusion. So the function of it is, is, is done. And now we need to bring, to, to have one uniform Quran for the Mus'haf, for the Ummah. So, the Qira'at are the, the remaining dialectical elements that can exist with the script that Uthman wrote. He spelled it out with the spelling of Mecca, but there were no dots and no short vowels. So, whatever dialect remained, okay, that's what we call a Qira'ah. And they're named after the scholars who codified them. Right? So, just like Madhabs. Right, just like we have madhabs, scholars who co- codified the Sharia. So likewise, these scholars codified. They said, "Okay, this is how I heard so and so recite from so and so from so and so with a chain of transmission." And that's where you get the ten. There is ten major ones, and four minor ones. And there are three conditions, right? Uh, the first is that it fulfills the requirements of the Osmani script. Two. The second is that it fulfills the requirements of the Arabic language, the grammar, etc. Last is that it has a senad, that it has a strong transmission. A chain, yeah. yeah. I didn't hear that third one before because the rules of Arabic came later. Yeah. I think there's difference in it. Some scholars, I think, say three. I don't know. Okay. Why, but because uh, the, uh, then the rules of grammar came later. Yeah. Right? But anyway, uh, you could be right. But what, what, uh, what I know is the first two that you said. It has to have a chain and it has to match the mushaf of Uthman. So that's what a qira, the qira'at are. It's nice to hear the Qur'an, especially Khalif and Hamza has unique features to it. Ibn Sulaiman Is it haram as a brother to say to another brother he has beautiful eyes? Or is that sus? I would, it's sus. In this day and age, it's sus. As, okay, in your language. I would just not do that. But, I mean, yeah, yani. If people would think that you're being a little bit, then don't do it. Tracy is a professional carer, okay? And she she also agrees about when it comes to women trying to raise teenage boys. Okay? You, you can't do it. Okay. Well, now I can't say you can't do it, but it'd be very. You would have to transform yourself too, as a woman. I used to think the same thing for men having to take to take care of babies. Right? He has to transform himself to become something so delicate that he may it may be that he can't function outside in society if he was repeatedly do that. That's why. Have you ever seen a nursery? Like um, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, one-year-olds, where a man is an employee there? Would you, if you had a baby, would you walk in your two-year-old to a nursery and a guy is there? How would you feel about that? I would feel like, no. No. I don't want that. It's not a problem to say that, you know, certain... Uh, functions in society should be done by certain other people. Of course, there may be situations, like Tahira was saying, there's a situation, she had to do, no no choice. All right, peace 
says, What to do with mother-in-law who does not wish well for her son or his family? Get a job far away. And then try to keep good ties from a distance. And Aishaba, Alishba, says, Should the person continue giving lectures on Ghazali's beginning of guidance? I understand there's a modern movement against the self. This is a bit unjustified and overarched. No, we should keep teaching more to sow from Ahl Sunnah. There are to sow from Ahl Sunnah such as Ghazali. Uh, th- that's the second part. The first part of Al Shiba's question is a person in the community gives lectures on Ghazali's Bidayat al Hidayah, which is hardly even to sow. It's just like basics. A couple people and an imam are telling this person to stop the lectures. Because it's tasawwuf. Because Ghazali was tasawwuf. So, so if, if, if they are the imam of the mosque, he should stop. You can't go against the imam of the mosque in the mosque. But if he's in his own private property or his own building, he should teach the book. We teach all Ghazali's book. Cover to cover, we should. All right, question here about Jannah says that what are the four things on this earth that are also in Jannah? I don't know. I never heard that before. I never heard that before. So I can't. I can't answer that question. But I could look it up. So the the Prophet ﷺ said the Nile, and the Euphrates, like in a, some spiritual sense, originated in paradise. The black stone is from paradise. What was the fourth one? Oh, is that that? So physically, things that are physically in paradise, from uh, here that are from. Paradise. The Roda, yes, the Roda is a piece of paradise. Oh, I see what you're saying now. Okay, yes. Um Maryam, the Roda is the area between the Prophet's house and the mimbar where he used to lead the prayer because he walked back and forth there so many times, it had a heavenly presence to it. Urgent question for a friend. Is such a job allowed in which have to pass food trays to patients which can also contain pork? The, the job is allowed, but that element may not be allowed. And if you are merely a transporter, you do, you're not responsible for asking what's in the package. If I'm merely a transporter, right? I'm UPS. I don't have to ask what's in the box. I don't have to look what's in the box. As long as I know that I'm not specifically transporting for like a wine company where everything is going to be haram. But if I'm a, I'm Amazon, right? What's on Amazon? 95% of it's halal, right? Regular stuff that people use. So if I'm transporting Amazon boxes, I don't have to look, I don't have to ask. So it may go the same way if you're working in the um, in a hospital and someone says, here, pass this tray of food. Okay, don't ask, don't look. Nuri says, why is it that Muslims can do or say in the first salam at the end of salah and not the second you can it's all fadl and nafl anyway the only thing that matters when you exit salah when you say assalamu alaikum you're out of salah whatever you add to the right or to the left after that is just nafl MJ Steele says, if we consider we are in the end times, should we not be concerned with Ahl al-Bayt since Imam will be from Ahl al-Bayt? We believe that he will be from Ahl al-Bayt, yes. But whether we're concerned about Ahl al-Bayt, whether we're tracking who's from Ahl al-Bayt or not, will not change anything. And anyway, Imam Mahdi, when he Imam Mahdi comes, we do not have to worry about that because we have shiuch. Our shiuch, they will inform us. Yes, this is Imam Mahdi. This is valid. We are way over here in the West. What do we know? Okay. All the events will happen over there in the East. Okay. They're the ones who will know and see, and they'll tell us. It's a fatwa, by the way. Who is Imam Mahdi? It's a fatwa. I'm not a mufti. I'm not going to tell you who is Imam Mahdi and who isn't. But I will tell you that so-and-so said he is. And we get an ijma, type of ijma, type of, uh, or, 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 or a, uh, a jumhur of the muftis of the East will tell us, yes, this is the imam. Why is this a fatwa? Because action is based upon it. Bay'ah. Obedience to him. This is a fatwa. Okay. 
And once there is a jumhur upon it, then we would act upon it. Okay? That's all we have to worry about. So that's why, it's, if you're worried about Imam Mahdi, ask yourself, do I, do I, am I connected in any way, shape, and form to shiuch over there? Work on that connection. The shiuch, the relied upon, fuqaha and muftis from those lands. Okay. There is a rise of Shia sympathy amongst the Gen Z and TikTok. Any thoughts? Uh. I think the sympathy should be with Sayyidah Aisha, who keeps getting blasphemed. That's where the sympathy should be. What are the? What are they worried about? Oh, people say bad things about them because you're Shia. Well, don't you say bad things about the Prophet's wife? That's Umm al Mu'minin, who say that Fatima loved. There's no two women of the Sahaba who talked more than Aisha and Fatima. Umm al Mu'minin, Sayyidah Aisha, and Sayyidat Nisa Ahl al Jannah, Sayyidah Fatima. They had a window, they shared a window. They were neighbors and shared a window and talked all the time through the window. For six months, Sayyidah Fatima died. Six months after. Why? Because their fathers were best friends. And Allah and the Messenger of Allah loved Fatima. So Aisha loved her because the Prophet loved him, because they were also similar age. Fatima was a little bit older. Their fathers were best friends. They love a man who loves them both. So they loved one another. Say to Fatima, when she Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told her something in her ear, and she wept. And then she told her another secret. And she smiled. Who was there? Aisha was there. So she asked. She said, what did he say? She refused to say. Then after the death of the Prophet wasallam, then Fatima told Sayyid Aisha. The first whisper was he told her that my time of death is coming soon. Then that's why she, she was sad. The second whisper is that you will be the first person to, follow, to die after me. Then I laughed. Who told who this? How do we know this piece of information? This story from Sayyidah Aisha. Because Sayyidina, Sayyidah Fatima told Sayyidah Aisha. Not only that, she chose to tell her that. She's the one who said, okay, you, I had, you had asked me about this. I refused to tell you. Now I'll tell you. The first thing the Prophet whispered to me was that his time of death will be soon. And the second thing is that I would follow him soon after. They shared a nafida, a window. They shared a wall, basically. This is a lie upon both of them. And you got a people who spend their theology and their whole religion cursing Sayyidah Aisha. And then they worry that people are upset and they want sympathy. May Allah guide them, to be honest with you. Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is masum, and he's he he's guided, except he doesn't know how to choose his friend and his wife. And anyway, Sayyid Aisha was not chosen by the Prophet; it was assigned by Allah subhanahu wa taala that marriage. You want to see why Allah chose that marriage? Look at who she became. Was there? Can you name one Muslim woman from the time of is, the beginning of Islam to the end of Islam who has more value to a nation on earth than say Aisha. No, I take that back. Find me any woman, period, who is more relied upon by an, a civilization and a nation and people and families live their life on what this woman taught than say Aisha. Name me one woman. Who's the competitive set? Marie Curie? What did she invent? Didn't she invent something major in science? Radiation or something? Okay. So she's someone important in the world. But we don't live our life based upon her. She invented something. Or she discovered something. Right? We live our life based on hadiths that she transmits. Based on tafsir that she gives. Based on fatawa that she gave. All of us live our lives based upon that. Live our lives based on that. Show me one other woman who competes with her. So we wonder why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose her as a, as a child 
to be raised by the Prophet ﷺ and married to the Prophet ﷺ, it's no wonder. Yes, it's not something that most people are used to, but well, look at the result. That's why. Also, the result is not something you're used to. Oh, wow, she married that young to the Prophet, peace be upon him. Oh, that's surprising. It's also very surprising how impactful she is in humanity, right? You don't get one without the other. You won't get an amazing uh, a result without an amazing beginning, a unique beginning. You can't have it both ways. You can't be living totally normal, and then all of a sudden, this is not the norm of human beings. If you're going to be amazing, then something in your youth had to be different too. Next question. <laughs> Had to get me going with that question. Qutub says, is it preferable to move to a Muslim country closer to where Imam Mahdi will present himself? No, I think it's most preferable to move to a community, not one Imam, a community that can help you raise your family. Whether that community is in Scotland, whether it's Sheikh Ibrahim OCF as Mustafa Mount, or whether it's somewhere else, in Malaysia, Indonesia, wherever it is, Turkey, wherever it is, if it's the community that matters because you need a group to help you. Can you please tell me about Ihya Ulum al and how to read it? I would ans answer by saying that try to read the summary first. Read the orange, big English translation summary of Ihya Ulum al Read this. this he, Imam al Ghazali summarized it himself. Read the summary first. But you have to understand something. Imam al Ghazali is a theoretician. There's a lot of things he says that are not acted upon. Like a lot of things. Okay. He says that are not acted upon. For example, he says whoever writes a book or whoever teaches the deen and takes a penny from it or takes anything from it, right? His ikhlas is out the window. Well, that's not the case. All the scholars sell their books, right? So there are a lot of exceptions you have to understand. When you read Ihya al Mudin, there's a lot of exceptions. And that's why the best thing is to try to listen to lectures about it too because the value of the scholars is that they, they explain what he meant by it and they explain uh, the parameters of what he's saying. If you like this live stream, be a supporter at patreon.com forward slash Safina Society. Again, patreon.com forward slash Safina Society. If you want to learn from us uh, formalized courses, go to arcview.org. Okay, arcview.org is our uh, platform for courses. Adam says, what is the difference between a zindiq and a mubtada? A zindiq is far worse than a mubtada. A zindiq negates that which is explicit and widespread in the religion, such as that hajj takes place in Mecca. Ramadan is a month of fasting. Prophet Muhammad is the last prophet. Like basics that are explicit and widespread. Mutawatir. That is a zindiq. But yet he says he's a Muslim. Okay. He, he, sa he says he is a Muslim. Okay? Now, what is a mubtada? A mubtada is someone who negates something that is explicit in the religion, but is not widespread. He's innocent until we inform him. Hey, hold on. You said you don't believe in this? Here's the evidence. Straight in the Quran or in the widespread hadith. and yet, uh, uh, or, or in a hadith. It wouldn't be mutawat. It would, that would be zindiq. In a hadith. He says, no, no, I'm sticking to my position. So what do we say about such a person? Such a person is neither a kafir, nor is he practicing Islam properly. So he's an innovator. And the innovator has a unique position in Islam. He's a Muslim whose good deeds do not count until he fixes his belief. And he will be rejected by the Prophet ﷺ at the fountain. The Prophet himself said this. They will come to me at the fountain. I recognize them as Muslims. But Jibreel says he altered the religion after you. So the Prophet says, go away, go away, go away. What is our interaction with them? It is haram to fraternize with them, to befriend them, to eat their foods, their meats, to uh, marry them, to um, pray behind them is sinful. 
But if you do, it is valid. So for example, if you marry someone who's an innovator, a mubtada' in aqidah we're talking about, that you are not in zina. You are in marriage, but you're sinful in doing so. Okay? If you pray behind an innovator, you are sinful in doing so, but your prayer is valid. If, that's if, his prayer is valid. Because they may not pray and make wudu properly. That's a different subject. So if he doesn't pray and make wudu properly, then your prayer is invalid. From that standpoint. So that's our, our relationship with them. We stay away from them. They have a virus. So we quarantine them. Just like we quarantine people in COVID. Rashid Ahmed says, or Rashid Ahmed, the more I seek knowledge, the more I question, question I have questions that's freaking me out. We'll keep seeking more knowledge and study who you're learning from too. Many people study from websites, watch videos without interrogating who am I listening to. The first thing when you go on a website is the about page. The first thing in the YouTube video, look up the person first. Uh, Khala White is asking about Shia Muptadars and Dikna Muptadya. They're Muptadya. Only a few of their minor cults amongst them or groups amongst them, they're called Ghulat. There is an adjaqa. The Ghulat of the Shia are the ones that say like, the, they, they say things that most of the Shia do not say, such as the revelation came to Ali. Uh, it was supposed to come to Ali, but then J- Jibreel made a mistake and gave it to Muhammad. What is this? That's absurd. Right? That's Kufr. Right? That, you're a Zindiq at that point. But the other things that they say would put them in the category of Muqtadiyah. They're Muslims. They're allowed to go to Mecca and Medina. But we said there was deeds. Your deeds do not count. Fix your deeds. We need a unification of the Sunnah and the Shia. But that unification is not a two-way unification. It's one way. You need to fix your beliefs. Okay? As I said, if you look at Islamic history, the moment that the, the Persia was lost, Persia was such a powerful country. Ghazali came from there. They were all Shafi'is, mainly. Okay, but the moment when they went to that route, that's where you saw the advancement of Islam. The Ottomans became busy with that rather than going west. And one of the things that Imam al Mahdi will do is he will guide these Shia. To, he will guide them to stop saying what they're saying about the Sahaba and also. Um, this imamate idea too. Um, Mo 21. What is Coptic belief? Coptic is an ancient word for Egyptian. That's why the word Egypt and Coptic sound similar. But today it refers to a type of Orthodox Christian. Um, Simon. The story of Simon. I have no knowledge about that. The one-eyed cobbler? No, I have no clue about that. No, I have no clue about that. In what? Rutgers is all Coptic Egyptians. The pharmacy department. All Coptic. Yeah. You know, get his mind like around that, and then we started debating like for like twenty hours. And after that, they all started like hug- I don't know why they started hugging me. They're like, "Oh, you, you know, you should come too." Like they were like, "Yeah, you know, like looking up to me." Kind of. Thing. Egyptians are generally nice people. Yeah, they're nice people. Yeah, the Coptics are uh, they're staunch. No, they're staunch. Yeah, I sat one time. We were in an airport. We were in an airplane going back to New Jersey, and my family was there, and there was an Egyptian Coptic guy from Rutgers that I used to see him all the time studying. Uh, in the coffee shops, in the local coffee shops. So he sat next to us, right? And I said to him, uh, so what, what were you doing? And he said, I was at a, a religious camp, right, in Chicago, like a Coptic Christian camp. And he goes off on saying, listen, I don't believe in this all religions are one. I was, and, and we're all good. No, there's true and false. I was like, I agree with you, right? I totally agree with you, right? We might have different conclusions about what's true, but I'm totally down with that. Lana says, you know who was a great mother that could discipline her sons? Safiya bin Tabd al Yes, but at the same time, that's totally true. But at the same time, keep in mind, there were so many uncles and grandpa, grandfathers and, you know, uncles. And that there was plenty of that, 
right? Um, that's why they were they were able to do those things because you had uncles, you had grandfathers. By the way, here's a quiz for you: How many uncles of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam lived to hear the message of the Prophet peace be upon him? How many? Four. Abu Talib, the oldest. Abu Lahab, next oldest. Abbas and Hamza. Four uncles of the Prophet. So I said. Opinion on skin fades and can you get a swoosh? Z- uh, what would you call that? Etched into the back of your head. The skin fade, the fade is um, in the Maliki school, if it is a um, clean and not asymmetrical, there is some room for it. Right? There is some room for it. Because what the Prophet meant when he talked about qaza was the asymmetrical haircuts where part of it, part of the head is shaved and part of it is, is long, such that it's asymmetrical. If it is clean and symmetrical, there are some, it won't be forbidden. And the swoosh, uh, I'm not going to, I don't think that you should do that, but probably between makru, maximum will be makru to do things like that. What do you say to a youth who says that stopping eating at 15 minutes before the 18 degree Fajr time resembles a Shia Suhoor time? No. Stopping 15 minutes before the end of Suhoor time is the Sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ said, stop eating the amount that it would take you to recite 60 verses. So that's what we call Imsak and is from the Sunnah. It's from the Sunnah. Uh, how do you raise children in this generation? By not keeping them sheltered, yet at the same time, they have to know right from wrong. My opinion is that we cannot raise children by ourselves. We need a community to help us. So we find a righteous, pious community of people that have a leader and a couple leaders, and we raise our kids with them because we're all going to come to the same conclusions. So there is there a sacred law on when a kid should get a cell phone? No. It's all by our conclusions. You get a group of pious and practicing Muslims to come together and think about this, and the conclusion they come up to will likely be what's good. Right? What's the most effective way to center your heart when you feel scattered, anxious, and worried? Is center your heart by... um, The best way to center your heart is to start making your salahs on time. Start to that start to uh, set your schedule right, and then I really like using these little cue cards to make lists, lists of what to do, and then do not move from one thing to the next until you finish it. Do you have to pay zakat on inheritance money? Well, inheritance money just goes not the day that you inherit it. No, inheritance money just goes into your wealth, your regular money. If you if it stays for a year, then yes, like with the rest of your money. But when you, if you want to put it aside for your kid's education, then yes, it's considered savings. So you're better off better to invest it. Okay. Let's see what else we got here. Why is Sayyidina Nuh singled out in al wurj al-Latif? Because Imam al-Haddad knew the end of time would be like the flood of Nuh. But the Prophet Sallallahu also said this. It would be like floods and uh, be like an ocean of fitna. So we're, we're very much like that. That's why you got to go to arcview.org and take the classes. Yeah, that's what we called it, Arcview. And the whole, the whole logo of Safina Society is based upon that concept. Yeah. What's the best dua to read after Fajr prayer? Or tahajjud. In tahajjud, the best dua is the dua that is something that you need from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if you notice, 
what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the hadith Qudsi, or sorry, the Prophet sallallahu states about Allah ta'ala is that Allah says, is there any person seeking forgiveness that I can forgive? Is there a person who needs help? Is there a person who wants something? So it is, tahajjud is a time for istighfar from sins and asking for personal desires and needs. Child S says J. Perez, why does the day end at Maghrib and there is one prayer left? Because the prayers in Islam are not just in the day. They're in the day and in the night. And Maghrib is considered the beginning of the night because although there is light in the western horizon, there's darkness in the eastern horizon. So the night has begun already. So there's two, there are actually uh, three prayers when the sun is under the horizon and two prayers when the sun is above the horizon there's only three two prayers in the daytime and three at night fajr is at night although the day has risen but the night is still there chocolate wall is asking for a friend you know that's going to be good he alternates going to isha and tarawih with his wife so someone with home with the kids he feels he should be able to go every night why would he be held in account for not would he be held into account for not going well the the misunderstanding here is that tarawih has to be in the masjid imam malik never prayed tarawih in the masjid he always prayed at home as long as the masjid is holding tarawih that's the communal obligation it's a sunnah mu'akkadah it's a communal sunnah mu'akkadah to ensure that tarawih is happening in the mosques not an obligation communal sunnah mu'akkadah so as long as it's tarawih is happening in the masjid Malik prayed at home. So there's nothing wrong in praying. Now, if you said this about the obligatory prayer, that would be different. No, it's more, it's a sunnah, stronger sunnah for the man to pray in the masjid and the women pray at home. But if you want to be part of the community, for example, and people need that these days, right? And I had long discussions with this, with scholars concurring with the concept that in the West, there's only Islam in the masjid. Now, and probably the East too, Right? And so, in order to um, be part of the community, meet Muslim friends, hear a lesson, what have you, all that stuff, to be part of the masjid community and the community center is important. So, if you interchange, you're not losing any reward because tarawih essentially is prayed at home first. But if your guy friends are making fun of him, maybe that's probably the real issue. We have in our community, in the community next door, something called Room 5A and Room 5B. You know about that? Oh, we'll have to tell you off, offline. Maryam says, can you make dua? I get to jo- to a job in Medina so I can visit Mecca and Medina. Muwafaqi, inshallah. Question from a friend from Lily Rose. If from work-related time and peer pressure bought lunch for people and one of the orders is a pork sandwich... I buy it for the said colleague. What's the expiation for such a sin? You have to make a stighfar. You have to make a stighfar. You got to make a stighfar for them. Your favorite Quran reciter? By the way, I don't mind this new reciter that's out that everyone's listening to. I really like him. Uh, Hashim al-Arabi. Omar Hashim al-Arabi. His, his recitation of Surah al-Rahman is amazing. Q Lodi says, I had a very bad migraine at work while fasting. That's enough. That is, permits you to break your fast. Okay. Next time you get a severe headache is a sickness. You can break your fast for that. Cybertonic, what's the best argument for photography? Uh, being permissible. Photography in general, it's what you're photographing that will make it halal or haram. In general, it's permitted. Maybe the Shafi'iyah have some issues with it, but the Malikis per- permit it. You're not drawing. You're not fashioning. You're capturing. So video and photography is permitted. It's just what you're photographing. Uh, and a lot of photographers, for example, if they have to do wedding photography, and of course some of that videography and the photo- photography may be munkar, then 
that's what would be forbidden, not the concept itself. Who are the Madikis in the UK? There is Sheikh Ahmed Al-Azhari. I believe his name is. Is in Birmingham. Is it makruh for women to go to the masjid? In the yes, the ruling of if there was fitna, then she should not go to the masjid. And that ruling um, was in a time where if her walking in the streets and the narrow alleys and then going to the masjid by herself in the big city would be a fitna, then yes, she shouldn't go there. And she wouldn't go anywhere where those conditions would be there. But in the world that we live in where the only Islam that we have is in community centers, then there is great value in the whole family going to these masajid. Because these masajid, it's the only place where you're going to see Islam. They're not even just masajid, by the way. They're, just, they're now in the form of community centers. That's what I view them, right? It's a place, where, the only place where you can meet Muslim friends sometimes. The only place where you could learn something. So there's a lot of benefit in those, in going. A couple more questions. It was said, but Melody's asking, if you love a brother, you should tell him. In a masculine way, of course. Yes, love, yeah. But you have nice eyes, mashallah, your biceps. No, that's going to make you, the guys are, are going to be worried about you. Okay. But love, yes, the Prophet did say, if you love someone, you tell them. And the, the response is, may the one for whom you loved me also love you. Taraweeh has an alif after the ra. Yes. Jay Perez, please briefly explain the difference between unlettered and illiterate. Unlettered, purposely, was not educated through books. Illiterate, unable to read. Slow, unable to be educated and, learn, and read. So that's why that's the subtle difference between unlettered and illiterate. Many people may not know that. So they may be, you know, get a pass for that, but that's the truth. That, that's the, that is the subtle distinction. Yeah. What are the conditions on talking to someone regarding the decisions of someone of authority without falling into backbiting? If someone makes decisions for the community or, or, or for a company or something, those decisions are public, correct? At least for the company. So someone makes a, a law or a policy for the company. That's a public policy. You can discuss it, right? You can, you can talk about it. If someone makes, uh, does anything public, to discuss it and critique it is not backbiting. It's permitted. Was in bare minimum of rakas for tarawih too. Is the bare minimum. Any amount of rakahs you pray from Aisha to the time you sleep is two. But keep in mind the Hanafi madhab, it's 20 or bust. Right, Omar? 20 or bust. In the Maliki madhab, there's no set number. You pray as many as you can or you, or you want. At home or in the masjid. In jama'ah or solitary. Out loud or silent. Yeah. Yeah, it's 3 12. We, and it does not have to be from Alif Lam Mim to Surah Al Nas. You can recite from any surahs of the Quran. What books of Tasawwuf do you recommend? I would recommend you read first all the works of Imam Al Haddad first, and then the books of Ahmad Zarruq second, then the books of Imam Al Ghazali third, then Al Sha'rani. Okay. Is it true that one must drink Zamzam water standing up facing the Qibla? Sunnah, not must. Recommended, but not must. You said in the beginning, Mu'mina says, that we should be positive. We must talk about what Allah, a uh, good that Allah has sent on us. But aren't we told to cancel our blessings in case of nadr? Yes, you only speak to people of the good that's happening to you as long as they won't be jealous. If someone will have envy for you, don't say anything. Okay. If someone will have envy against you, then don't say anything. Sayyida says that in the South Asian culture, Ahl al-Bayt only marries Ahl al-Bayt so they could keep the lineage. But um, 
you're not obligated to do this. If, if you want to do that, you can, but you're not obligated to. Can you tell us about your days of study and your teachers? My days of study, there wasn't a lot of opportunity, I have to say. And you had to scrap to go find a sheikh to study. But the way that we did it was that you, you learned the curriculum. You learn like what are the first what are the th- first let's say three books in grammar, aqidah, fiqh, hadith, and then you studied them with whoever you studied with them with. So Risalat ibn Abi Zaid, for example, I studied that started it with Sheikh Salik bin Sidna, then read a little bit with Sheikh Abdul Rahman wal Sidi Muhammad, then read a little bit of it with then went back to Sheikh Salik and finished it with him. Okay, oh then I also read so part of it with. Sheikh Muhammad al-Jindi of Egypt in his house, a couple chapters, okay, and then finished it with Sheikh Salih bin Sidna. That's an example of how things were, because I wasn't aware and or able to go to these institutions, so I had to take the curriculum and study with whoever I could, sometimes in person, sometimes by phone. And now, with WhatsApp and with Zoom, I still study Maliki Fiqh. Uh, with shiuch in Egypt over the phone on Zoom, yani. The English translation of Keshv al Mahjub. I can't. I I don't know. I can't remember to be honest if it's a good translation or if it's loyal to the meaning. Is the Orientalist? I don't trust them. What is a cure for jealousy? If you're jealous of somebody, look at their troubles in life. Look at how hard things are for them in life. You may be seeing the good side of their life. Look at the hard side of their life. So we're the opposite. When it comes to us, only say what's good happening to you. When it comes to others, look at their hardships. It'll make you forego a lot of your anger towards them or your jealousy towards them. And make du'a for them too. But also also make du'a for yourself. Oh Allah, you gave him such a wonderful life. Give me that life and preserve it for him. Give him more and give me more too. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not jealousy. Do we pay zakat on gold that is owned for multiple years? You, if you wear the gold and you intend it as jewelry, you don't wear it. Uh, you don't pay zakat on that. What's the Hanafi ruling on that? You wear, you pay zakat on gold jewelry. If you wear it, you don't pay zakat on it. Or if you even intended it as jewelry, okay. Should the wife and children take bay'ah to the father because he's their guide? No, they don't need bay'ah to the father. They're already obligated to follow him. Bay'ah is someone that I don't have to follow, that I'm telling you I commit to following you. So there's no bay'ah when there's an obligation. Okay. Umm Maryam says, Sheikh, for summer intensive, for single female, will there be financial aid and housing for eight weeks? We would have to look up and find housing. We, if we get enough people, we will, we can possibly sublet an apartment. Okay. If you're un, if you have no cash at hand, but you have savings, do you pay zakat? Yes, you pull from the savings and you pay the zakat on it. What dhikr is should we do for Pakistan's awful political situation? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. That's that's the thicker for that. Qadr Allah ma sha'a fa'al. A lot of questions. Unfortunately, we can't get to all of them. C.E. Mu'mina says, I believe Jummah is fard and mandatory for men to attend if they're able to. Yes, if he is present and he is of age and he is healthy, then he must go to Jummah. We just have to remember that Allah is the one who provides, not our job. Yes. Is the summer intensive online? No, it's not online. How do you remain steadfast in the deen? By being part of a Jummah. Because when you have a lull, they'll pick you up. When you're up, you pick other people up. Muslim traditionalists, I have to work on Friday. It's not possible to go to, to the masjid. Oh, that's what Mu'mina is responding. I can't leave the site. I also have the choice to work or not on Friday in my job. But I need more money. 
um, first of all, how far is your job from the masjid? Right? If it's far away, then you don't have to pray Juma. Pray the Lord. And the distance is not that far either. Just check your, your, your method, what it says about that. But otherwise, Juma is a fart. Okay? Muhammad Junaid, yes, we are going to you, um, UTMSA next Wednesday too, on virtual, of course. Okay. Um, I have seen single mother sons, says Tracy. Single mother sons looking after small children in the nurseries. They do their best job but suffer when alone as society makes fun of them and they don't understand. It's unfixable sometimes. Allah. Can you explain how ma'lum min ad-deen bid-darura is derived in Islam? If something is explicit in the religion and is widespread to the point that any child, like 12-year-old child, grew up around Muslims, will know this thing, that is known in religion by necessity. Hey, so far, it's impossible not to know this. Muhammad Ali says, I feel hypocritical when I do daily salawats with the primary intention of getting my affairs sorted. That, that's, that is acceptable. There's nothing to be hypocritical about. Worshipping Allah for self-benefit. Allah himself says that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself tells us that أَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ طَرَفَيَ اللَّيْلِ wa أقم الصلاة طرفي الليل و أقم الصلاة طرفي الليل و طرفي النهاري أقم الصلاة طرفي النهاري و and what is سلفا من الليل I don't want to make the mistake there but it refers to تهجد حسا أن يرفعك ربك مقام محمودا okay um Subhanallah. There, I'm not remembering the ayah, but Allah Ta'ala has made us worship Him for the sake of self benefit. That is ibadah. For self benefit. Now I have to find the ayah. Not acceptable to forget such an ayah. وأقم الصلاة طرفي النهار وزلفا من الليل إن الحسنات يذهب نسيت ذلك ذكرى للذاكرين. Yes, fasting brain. Thank you for the excuse. Fasting brain. Definitely. Um, subhanallah. Anyway, in any event, the we are we are given to we are encouraged to do a bad for ourselves. Okay, we are encouraged to do that. So there is nothing selfish or hypocritical about it. That is one of the stations of ibadah, is that I'm doing ibadah for, for myself. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let us close up with Dua Anur today. Okay. Close up with Dua and Noor. All right. What should you do if you step in some filth during Umrah between Safa and Marwa? Filth as in Najasa? You would be obligated to clean that out. You find some source of water to clean it out. Can you do Tawaf on a hoverboard? Sinful but valid. 
sinful because it's like making a joke out of it or something. Plus, you're going to get knocked down badly. And you're going to bother everybody. And you're going to get attention for yourself. So it's sinful, but it would be valid. Are prawns halal? Yes, they are. Some of the Hanafis may have differ, may differ on that. I washed and finished. Is that okay? Yes, inshallah. But where did you wash? How far did you walk away? That's the question. He doesn't have it there on the left? Out there? Okay. That's okay. Next time we'll get it. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم اجعل لي نورا في قلبي ونورا في قبري ونورا في سمعي ونورا في بصري ونورا في شعري ونورا في بشري ونورا في لحمي ونورا في دمي ونورا في عظامي ونورا في عصبي ونورا من بين يدي ونورا من خلفي ونورا عن يميني ونورا عن شمالي ونورا من فوقي ونورا من تحتي اللهم زدني نورا واعطني نورا واجعل لي نورا وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us and to increase our siyam throughout the year and to increase our qiyam and to increase our tahajjud and to accept our ibad and accept our dua and we ask Allah Ta'ala to make the Qur'an the spring of our hearts. And we ask Allah Ta'ala to give us consistency upon the deen. And to make us a source of benefit for the ummah. And to let us be a source of khidmah for the ummah from now until the day we meet him. We ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala to uh, grant us all that we are asking of him in this month of Ramadan. And thereafter, we ask Allah to have mercy upon all the ummah. Especially those of the Uyghurs and the Rohingyans and the Muslims of Kashmir and the Muslims of Afghanistan, and the Muslims suffering in all the lands of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And lastly, we ask that Allah make none more beloved to us than his most beloved Sayyid al Kunain, Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh